Welcome back to the Hemlock Water Dropwort channel, where every video warns you about the toxicity of this common waterside plant. This is Hemlock Water Dropwort. It's a common plant. It may look delicious, but it's deadly. A number of people have commented under my foraging videos to suggest using apps to identify plants for foraging, but do they work? And if they work, is it a good idea to use them in that way? I've been thinking about making this video for quite a long time, but it was this comment in particular that prompted me to get on and do it. Someone asked, I used a plant ID app to find chamomile and made some tea with it, and it came out quite bitter, but did have the right chamomile taste if I used just one flower head. Did I do something wrong? Well, I happen to know that chamomile is one of a number of similar and related plants that are a little difficult to tell apart at first glance and that are found in similar sorts of places. Fortunately, the most likely outcome of getting identification wrong in the specific case of chamomile is that your chamomile tea will taste horrible. It's a bit less likely that the wrong kind of chamomile would poison you to death, but as we saw in the getting started foraging video, there are other mistakes that you could make between similar looking plants that are not so easy to just walk off. Before we start, I'll put on a bit of B-roll while we deal with the preliminaries. This is critical background to the testing process, but if you want to skip this part, the timestamp's right there. I think it's probably necessary to acknowledge my own potential biases. I've been interested in nature and wildflowers since I was a young child, and that was a number of decades ago. I'm not a young child anymore. And so my knowledge, such as it is, has been built up by a process consisting mostly of looking at things, trying to identify them in books, and asking other people who might already know what they are. With this background, you might imagine a tendency to be a bit of a Luddite when it comes to plant ID apps, and that I might be rejecting them because they're different and newfangled. But as far as I can, I try to avoid that sort of thing. Resistance to change, particularly technical change, is something I've trained myself to avoid. Fun example, while the rest of the world was whining and griping about how they hated Windows 8 and would never upgrade, I just got on and used it as best I could and everything was fine. So just one little data point there for you. So I'm not going to come down on plant ID apps just because they're new. I am, however, going to admit my preconception that they might be slightly unhelpful in the long run if they just dish out the answers without embedding an understanding of how to arrive at that answer. A bit like the difference between learning to be good at doing maths versus scoring well in a specific test just by having a clever friend whisper the correct answers in your ear. We'll see, though, whether this preconception of mine is borne out in the reality of testing. I won't be trying every available app out there. I'll focus on a few that can be used without subscriptions or purchases, specifically PlantNet, Seek and Google Lens, the latter of which is more of a general purpose identification tool than just identifying plants, of course. I won't be testing any apps that are specific to iOS because I just don't happen to own any Apple devices. Testing is going to be really simple. I'm just going to head out and find some wild plants and test each app on them in turn. I obviously can't make the test conditions absolutely identical, but I'll test the same parts of the same specimen on each app and show you the results. Starting off with this plant, which is common hogweed. Google Lens correctly identifies the leaf as common hogweed. However, matches for the flowers were all over the place, which is somewhat understandable. Many plants in this family, Apaceae, the celery family, have very similar looking flowers. Google Lens thought this could be anise or poison hemlock, so quite the spectrum of possibilities there. Next, PlantNet, which uses location to assist with the relevance of the search from its Western Europe database, which is an entirely sensible idea. PlantNet correctly identified the leaves as hogweed with a 77% confidence level and only 1% match against giant hogweed. Interesting photo down there by giant hogweed, by the way. After this person touched giant hogweed like that, their skin will have blistered most severely when exposed to daylight. But that's another story. PlantNet also gave hogweed as the top match for the flowers, but top match here is only 36% confidence. This top match and confidence level is one potential pitfall for users of this app, but I'll talk more about that later. Seek also wanted to use location and narrowed it right down to my home county. Nice and useful little disclaimer stroke warning dialogue there about respect and safety. Good stuff. Seek immediately recognised the leaves as hogweed and likewise with the flowers, except the app is sometimes a bit laggy and the identification shown on the screen is the last thing it identified, not necessarily the thing that you're looking at right now. Seek operates on a real-time feed from the camera rather than a snapshot, so depending on the framing of the shot, Seek actually wavered between the species, family, and occasionally only the class, but somewhere in there it was confident that this was common hogweed. Okay, so that's a good start. Let's head off and look for a few other things. This blackberry plant. Google Lens said it was a red raspberry. It definitely is not. On a second attempt, Google Lens said Pacific blackberry. Still not right, but closer. PlantNet's top match was dewberry with a 46% match, but this plant is definitely not dewberry. Seek wouldn't narrow it down any further than 
brambles, that is the genus Rubus. And weirdly, this might actually be the most accurate description, because what we think of as blackberries are actually a really messy collection of subspecies and varieties that are quite promiscuous and readily interbreed to form hybrids and intermediate forms. This is most likely a bramble hybrid that's mostly blackberry with a little bit of dewberry in the mix. So this might not seem like a very fair test, except that that's what blackberries are like. I think this is an interesting example of the difficulties of plant identification. And again, we'll talk about that later, but for now, let's move on and find another plant. Next, a non-native plant here that must have escaped from someone's garden. Google Lens had no trouble correctly identifying it as Lecisteria formosa or pheasant berry. PlantNet was 99% confident on the same identity and Seek also went straight to the correct identification. Next up, a wild rose, and I think this is a field rose. But again, roses can be quite variable and tricky, for the same reason as blackberries to which they are related. Google Lens offered a variety of rose species, including field rose. PlantNet's best match was also field rose, Seek settled on dog rose, which I think is incorrect. Dog rose flowers are a bit more pink than this, typically. Next, this grass-like plant, which is not actually a true grass. This is called Pendulous Sedge. All three apps recognise this plant quickly, although, interestingly, PlantNet calls it Giant Sedge and Seek calls it Hanging Sedge. It has a variety of common names, so none of those are wrong. Next, Hemlock Water Dropwort, this being the Hemlock Water Dropwort channel. And this is where it all went a bit horribly wrong. From the leaves, Google then suggested this might be a type of bristle fern, or various species of Artemisia, wormwoods and mugworts, that is, or coriander, that is, cilantro, or tansy. Google Lens was far too eager to offer edible matches for this deadly toxic plant, for my comfort here. PlantNet's top match was correct, hemlock water dropwort, but only with 44% confidence, with edible parsley next in line at 12%. Seek went straight to hemlock water dropwort, to my slight relief. From the flowers of this incredibly deadly plant, Google Lens was keen to suggest that it might be Angelica or Caraway, although the hemlocks were also in the matches there somewhere. PlantNet's top match for the flowers was correct with a 49% match, and Seek went through an interesting process of narrowing down carrot family, water dropworts, hemlock water dropwort. Next up, a specimen that's been puzzling me a bit. This is a hogweed, but it's much taller than me. Maybe two and a half metres tall, getting on for three metres. It's a big hogweed, but is it giant hogweed? The leaves are a bit more spiky than the norm for common hogweed, but not as jagged and cut as I would expect from giant hogweed. I can't actually decide what this is. The location where I found it growing is clearly very damp and fertile. All the other plants growing nearby are also fine, upstanding specimens. So this could just be a really big, robust example of common hogweed. Or it could be an atypical example of giant hogweed. Or it could be something else altogether. Google Lens wasn't sure if it was Persian hogweed, giant hogweed, or American cow parsnip. PlantNet was 66% certain that it was regular hogweed, with giant hogweed in second place at 16%, and Seek recognised it was in the carrot family but would not commit to an identification. So collectively, these apps are about as confused and conflicted as I was. And it's okay to be unsure, especially and crucially if you are able to know that you're unsure. I'm not touching this plant, just in case. What do you reckon it is? Next, this lovely plant in the mint family called Woundwort because people used to use it medicinally to treat cuts and wounds. All three apps identified this without any trouble. Just behind the wound work, there's Meadowsweet, an aromatic plant with fluffy white flowers that at first glance you wouldn't expect to place it in the rose family, but it is. Again, all three apps had no trouble identifying it. Next up, this little pink woodland plant, which is Geranium robertianum, or Herb Robert. Google Lens went straight to it, as did PlantNet, but Seek was convinced it was Shining Crane's Bill, a close relative, but a wrong identification. Slight change of scenery now, out of the woods and off to Botley Quay. And here's a little clump of common comfrey plants, aptly demonstrating one of its rather variable features. Purple flowers on one plant, pure white on another. Google Lens had no trouble, neither did PlantNet, but Seek struggled a little bit. It narrowed it down to comfrey, but not the species, at least not for the white-flowered variant. When I pointed it at the purple one, it finally decided it was common comfrey. And gosh, that's a lot of hemlock water drop work there. Next, this plant, which is teasel. You can just see the bristly, cone-like flower heads developing on this specimen. Google Lens came up with some completely wrong guesses that aren't even found in this country. PlantNet and Seek went straight to the right answer. Next, and sort of related to that comment about chamomile tea, there are two different plant species growing here, both with sort of feathery leaves, both with classic yellow and white daisy flowers. One plant a little bit bigger and more robust and deeper green than the other. Now, I sometimes struggle to identify some of the plants in this group visually, but I'm really familiar with the smaller one. It's German chamomile. Let's call that plant A. And I think the larger one, which we'll call B, is scentless mayweed. 
but I'm slightly less sure of that identification and I didn't have my books with me on this trip. Google Lens identified B as scentless mayweed and A as a species of anthemis, stinking chamomile, which I think is incorrect. Plantnet identified B as German chamomile with a 53% match, but that's wrong. The second match at 24% is the correct one. Plantnet did correctly identify plant A as German chamomile. Seek took a very long time to narrow it down from the family level, but eventually identified both plants correctly. So one thing that I think is really different about identifying things from a reference book is that you're nearly always presented with more information than just the bit you think you're looking for. For example, when I go looking for chamomile in my field guide, I'm immediately struck just by looking at the page that there are a number of different similar species. I'm almost without realising it switched into a thought process of differentiation. That is, rather than trying to match a thing in front of me with an identification that I wish it was, I'm forced to think about what makes it different from this other sort of similar thing. And that's really important in the context of foraging. I've heard it said that wishful thinking is one of the key factors in misadventurous poisoning in amateur foraging. Wishful thinking makes people try to fit an observation against a desired identification, rather than looking for reasons why it might not be that thing. The other thing that you automatically get from books is an appreciation and understanding of taxonomic families. You eliminate a vast swathe of potential misidentification by absorbing a set of reasonable expectations for various plant families. The BlackBerry identification task was interesting in a way that I think is worth talking about. None of the apps could really give me a very accurate or very confident identification, and that's actually perfectly valid because of the variability of plants in that family. However, without a completely accurate species identification, I know as a forager that the fruits from this plant are going to be edible, because that's true of all of the related species. So there's a piece of general knowledge that applies here that is useful at a general level, without the specifics that those apps struggle to specify. So anyway, I played with these three apps for a couple of days in the context of plant identification. A lot more of it than the examples you've seen here, but these are fairly typical results. In summary, they're pretty good at what they do, but they are sometimes, like maybe 5 to 10% of the time, confidently incorrect. And this is the part that concerns me the most. Now, don't get me wrong, even after doing this myself for decades, I still find myself uncertain about identifying specific plants now and again. But when I'm unsure of plant identification myself, I nearly always sense that I am unsure. And whilst I might still say, I think that's probably X, that sense of uncertainty affects what I do next. If I don't know that I'm sure about what a thing is, I won't pick it for the table. I might not even touch it. To a certain extent, I think these apps wave away some of that safe uncertainty in their attempt to show you an answer. Even PlantNet, with its match confidence percentage, still presents a top result, and commonly scores 50% or less even when it has the correct answer. And I feel like this might condition the users to accept lower scoring, incorrect answers. So am I going to say that these apps and others like them are a bad thing? No, not at all. A rising tide lifts all boats. Anything that gets people more interested in observing and understanding the natural world around them has the potential to be a really good thing, I think. I particularly like the way the Seek app sort of gamifies the process of collecting nature observations. I think that's an interesting way to get young amateur naturalists started off. But even though these apps do link through to detailed information about the species they identify, I do wonder whether people will bother to look at that. When you identify plants from a book or other conventional reference source, you have to walk through the detailed information about the habitat, the size, the texture, the season, the smell, the tiny physical details of the plant, and so on because those things are diagnostic to the identification process, and exposure to all of those little details naturally builds into a body of knowledge about some of the more fundamental aspects of plant biology and habitats and so on. The sorts of places you will find this family, the sorts of features you expect to see in that other family. When I identify a new plant by conventional methods, that is, books and the knowledge in my head, I can describe to you exactly how I reached that answer. I can tell you which specific features and criteria I observed. In most cases, the apps won't have even had a chance to evaluate some of those criteria because they're working solely on image, season and location. Not smell, not habitat, not the sorts of tiny anatomical details that are hidden at first glance. So there is, at the very least, an opportunity to skip all of that when you use these apps and end up with knowledge that's perhaps just as broad, but not as deep. But the question we need to get back to is this, are these apps suitable for identifying plants for foraging? I think my only answer to that has to be a very strong no, given that the stakes include ample opportunities for painful death. The apps are surprisingly good at what they do, but they're not nearly reliable enough to bet your life on. Well, yours maybe, but not mine. 
The key issue, in my view, is that they don't require the user to gain more than this superficial grasp of the topic, and that superficial grasp is what leads people to step out with false confidence and grab the not chamomile and make awful bitter tea, or pick the not parsley, you know, hemlock water dropwort, and die. I will continue using these apps myself because they're fun and they're a useful tool when I'm really stuck on a plant ID, but going from stuck to suddenly having the potentially right answer is the first step, not the last one. When I use these to identify an unknown plant, that's going to be the beginning of further reading and research, not the end of the journey. I hope that I've managed to maintain a fair approach in evaluating these apps, or at the very least, to properly understand and honestly acknowledge my own stance regarding their use. I hope this has been useful, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.